Good. You did good. Today we're going to be giving a kind of double lecture. Fujiko has much experience in what are usually considered non-Western religions and ways of thinking, having grown up in a country with a background where most of the religion is Buddhism and Shintoism and the uniquely Japanese combination of the two. I have some experience in what might be considered the cultural natural science, in particular in the field of astrophysics and lately of quantum physics. The natural science community has sometimes been considered to be at odds with the religious community, and so the term Christian science has often not been considered to refer to a science. For example, Christ Jesus, however, did not say he came to start a new religion. When asked about his mission, he said, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. From his own words, we see that Christ Jesus thus stated that his mission was to reveal the truth, not a, note the singular, the truth. So we might say that he came to reveal and bear witness to reality, the spiritual reality of God's making. He argued that reality was spiritual and not material, and he did many good works of healing that caused people to question their previous notions of what they thought was real. He gave us a way to recognize this truth also. He said, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It is of note that truth makes free. If something does not make you free, then it is not the truth. Jesus certainly spent a lot of his time demonstrating the truth by freeing people from sickness, from sin, from death. His mission was to illustrate this grand principle of truth as the underlying nature of reality. Mary Baker Eddy, who discovered and founded Christian Science, writes in the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, it has been said, and truly, that Christianity must be science, and science must be Christianity, else one or the other is false and useless. But neither is unimportant or untrue, and they are alike in demonstration. So this proves the one to be identical with the other." End quote. Note the criterion for the one to be identical with the other. They are alike in demonstration. This is a scientific requirement. Could it be that Christ Jesus was a scientist and that Christianity and science are not only compatible but actually identical? If the truth makes free, then might not Christ Jesus have been illustrating an underlying principle of truth by healing and overcoming limitations of all kinds? Did he come to reveal reality? Was that his true mission rather than just starting a religion? Can we picture Jesus as a scientist? What in modern times is known as the scientific method is based on a straightforward process. The process of science was basically invented so we wouldn't fool ourselves. So we wouldn't be fooled by the evidence of material senses. So we wouldn't think the earth is flat or the sun goes around the earth, for example. So what in modern times is known as the scientific method is based on a straightforward process. One starts with theory, then one draws logical conclusions that must result from that theory, and then one makes predictions that must finally be experimentally verified. In the scientific community, one does not rely upon human authority. It is the experimental verification that decides the truth or not of a theory. As we will see from his own statements, Christ Jesus required experimental verification from his followers. His followers are those who were to apply the method of healing with reality. And I might add Christian science, when I'm asked how does it heal, I say it heals with reality. So let's examine this, let's examine this idea a little further. What if you lived 2,000 years ago and you wanted to teach the scientific method that experimental results are more reliable than mere human opinion. How would you put it to, say, your students? How might you, how might you put this to the religious establishment of the time? 
The, this religious establishment once asked Christ Jesus who bore witness of him. And he replied that it was not human authority that bore witness to the truth of what he said. He basically said, they said, was it, is it John the Baptist? And he said, John is the best human authority, but I don't rely on human authority. And this is new. This scientific approach to what verifies truth is new. Christ Jesus may have been the first person to put it this way. He said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John the Baptist, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not the testimony from man. I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Father was Jesus' name for the principle and creator of the universe. So, my works bear witness of me as great a disciple, as great a prophet as John the Baptist is. My works bear witness of me. This is new. I don't know anybody else in history did this, but said that before. So Christ Jesus said that rather than even the highest human authority, it was his healing works that were the actual true test of the truth of what he taught. So we have perhaps for the first time in history a statement of the scientific method. The experimental verification is more important and reliable than human authority. Jesus taught that there was an infinitely powerful, omnipresent, and always loving principle of the universe that wipes out false notions of mortality and limitation. And he always relied upon his healing works to bear witness to this truth. He talked about and demonstrated a creation of such perfection that even a glimpse of this underlying reality was enough to heal. Jesus called this divine principle of perfection our Father. A man would come up to Jesus and say, look, I have a withered hand. And Jesus would say, no, you don't. The man would look again and see that he must have been mistaken, <laughs> as his hand was whole. When he saw reality the way Christ Jesus did, he saw that spiritual perfection was what was true about him all along. So Jesus healed with spiritual reality. Mrs. Eddy writes of Jesus' healing method, Jesus beheld in science the perfect man, who appeared to him where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. In this perfect man, the Savior saw God's own likeness, and this correct view of man healed the sick. Thus, Jesus taught that the kingdom of God is intact, universal, and that man is pure and holy. Jesus said that he could of himself do nothing and that his Father God does the works. There's a Zen Buddhist saying, it's never too late to do nothing. <laughs> and I like that as applied to what Jesus said. It's never too late to, I can of my own self do nothing. <laughs> Jesus said that he could of himself do nothing and that his God, his Father, principle of the universe, does the works. So seeing what God sees produces healing. But does God always see perfection? Is there a precedent for understanding this? One analogy that I thought of recently and discussed with a Christian science teacher, um, Mark Sweeney, was that the, the sun can never see a shadow. And not only doesn't cast a shadow, but you tell the sun there's such a thing as shadow. And you go, the sun says what? You go, there's such a thing as shadow, like this rock here. Look behind the rock, there's a shadow. The sun goes. <laughs> so God does not see mistakes. Let's take a look at math just for a minute. I'm not going to go too much into it. I've done this before, but when a mistake like 2 plus 2 is 5 is found written on the blackboard in chalk, how do we approach the solution? Let's ask some questions. Do you think right away that the principle of mathematics has made a mistake? No. You know that mathematics never changes and is always perfect and universal. So do you think that you have made a mistake? 
Well, in some sense, it seems that one may have made or created a mistake all by oneself, that one can create something that mathematics cannot, but the mistake can only be real if you can create something that math cannot. The mistake you made is not true, and that is why it is called an error, the opposite of truth. So where is a mistake? Where did it come from? Can one even explain the origin and existence of 2 plus 2 equals 5? If the mistake or error is not in mathematics itself, then the mistake must be in the chalk. <laughs> we know that mathematics is never in the chalk. I think everybody would agree mathematics is not in the chalk. Although the chalk and looking for chalk in the universe is not the way to find mathematicians in the universe, let me tell you. Although the chalk can express, math express mathematics in a limited way, if the equation is written correctly, the mathematics is never subject to the chalk. Chalk is a limited way of looking at the real thing if the equation is written correctly, but mathematics is never in the chalk and never subject to the slightest mistakes expressed in the chalk. This mistake is not real and has no power. Error can only seem to have power if you believe it to be true. Then it seems to have power to mess things up. If you believe 2 plus 2 is 5, it seems to be this evil power that messes up your account book. <laughs> but it's never true. And the only power it has is to mess you up if you believe it. And you only believe it because the chalk is telling you, not the mathematics. <laughs> the mathematics, right? Where is the right answer? Right where the chalk seems to be. Well, of course, Mrs. Eddy, the chalk is matter, and the truth is the spiritual nature of reality. So we start with perfect God and perfect man as the basis of thought and demonstration. Only if you believe the false evidence of the chalk can an error exercise its only seeming power to try to mess you up. If you quit believing in the error, it will no longer be able to affect you. So as I studied more about what Christ Jesus said regarding his mission, I again saw the emphasis on demonstration of the truth, a demonstration of spiritual reality in opposition to the false evidence of the material senses. Well, that's science. 400 years ago, when we gave up the idea that the sun went around the earth for the truth that the earth went around the sun, that was in direct contradiction to the material senses. So that's when you start, that's called a scientific revolution in history of science. And that's when you start doing science. Science is not about material sense observations, it's about overcoming them with the evidence of intelligence, which supersedes the evidence of the senses. Science starts when you start taking the evidence of intelligence as more reliable. Christ Jesus went on to state that only experimental verification was acceptable as evidence of the truth he demonstrated. He said, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. So not only are works the only thing that are important, but if you don't do the works, don't believe that person. Don't even believe me if I don't do the works. One might say in modern science lingo, you are not to blindly believe a theory without experimental verification. This is a tenet of the natural science community. Christ Jesus said it in many ways. For example, by their fruits you shall know them. But if such Christian healing is scientific, then others should be able to demonstrate such a reality also. And this is also what Christ Jesus taught. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go unto my Father. So the spiritual understanding of healing could be applied by others. This meant it was not the result of the personal charisma of Christ Jesus, but a general principle of the universe that everyone could demonstrate. That's science too. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. Mrs. Eddy said of Jesus, our master taught no mere theory, doctrine, or belief. It was the divine principle of all real being which he taught and practiced. His proof of Christianity was no form or system of religion and worship, but Christian science, working out the harmony of life and love. So over a hundred years ago, a New England lady named Mary Baker Eddy made a great scientific discovery, which I think is the greatest discovery in history. Studying the process of healing through various methods, she saw that so many healing methods, one and all, 
beside Christian science boiled down to the thought of the patient. To her, the placebo effect was not something to just be named and then ignored as we do today, at least in the medical community. There's no additional understanding in just naming something, but there's somehow an illusion that it, you find comforting. What's that? Well, that's a snurd clerk or something. It's like, oh, okay. I know any more than we knew before. What's that? Placebo. So it's the name of the medical community for a process that is not understood, except that Mrs. A explained it over 100 years ago thoroughly. When you pretend that all this process by a name means, when you pretend that the process of naming something means you understand it, you're fooling yourself. Mrs. Eddy, however, went, actually wanted to apply the scientific method and find out the real source of her healing when she fell on the ice and a fall that was thought to be fatal. She knew there had to be a divine principle of healing and that this must be the truth that Christ Jesus was talking about, demonstrating and teaching others. If others could be taught to heal in this way, it must not be the result of personal charisma or power, but rather a universal principle or science. By studying the healings of Christ Jesus and his instructions regarding this healing, like going to the Father, like doing nothing of oneself, being perfect as the Father, and so on, many ways that Christ Jesus drew this analogy between us and the principle of the universe, Mrs. A discovered for the modern age what Jesus' healing method had been and what it was based upon. And today we have that in Christian science. Mary Baker Eddy discovered what Christ Jesus had been teaching, that is, that reality is perfect. People say, oh, can you give me in a, say, can you give me in a sound bite what Christian science is all about? I just say, all is infinite mind and reality is perfect. Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He did not say, become ye therefore perfect, but be perfect. And he said, the Father is already perfect. So his, her creation must be perfect now. So in Christian science, all healings are instantaneous. They do not depend on time at all. Time is a part of usual medical treatment. Whether it is waiting for six weeks for a bone to heal or taking two aspirin and calling the doctor in the morning. Time is no part of applying the reality of spiritual perfection because it reveals perfection that is already true, but appears to human thought as a healing. But every healing in Christian science is instantaneous and has nothing to do with time. Time is not a healer. It is usual for even natural scientists to take the evidence of intelligence as more reliable indicator of reality than the so-called obvious evidence of the senses. The field of natural science, according to historians of science, was actually developed as a method in order to mitigate the effects of the material senses. If scientists blindly believed the evidence of the material senses, then the Earth would still be considered to be flat, and the Sun would still be thought to orbit the Earth rather than the other way around. So clearly, this scientific method is not about taking the evidence of the material senses as verbatim truth. Quite the opposite is true. And you can't really say that I went up in a rocket and I, there was an instantaneous healing of the flat earth. It's like, mm, no, it was your perspective that changed. And that's how you describe to me a Christian science healing. Nothing outside was fixed. As the, math, as the mathematician and philosopher Bertrand Russell put it, physics is based upon the assumption that things are as they appear, and then it proceeds to prove that things are not as they appear. Mary Baker Eddy described it as academics of the right sort are requisite. Observation, invention, study, and original thought are expansive and should promote the growth of mortal mind out of itself, out of all that is mortal. Well, I think Bertrand and Mrs. Eddy were saying the same thing. Real science actually starts when one begins to take the evidence of intelligence as superior to the evidence of the senses and reaches its culmination in Christian science. Scientists argued, for example, that the Earth orbits the Sun in spite of the material sense evidence to the contrary. But that, giving up the evidence of that senses, started what is called the scientific revolution 400 years ago. 
Einstein once said, science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. One of the definitions of lame is disabled so that movement is impossible. One of the definitions of blind is unable to perceive or understand, not being based on reason or intelligence. So, in some sense, we might paraphrase Einstein and say, science without religion, a sense of the sacred or spirituality, cannot move forward. And religion without science, without understanding, does not know where to go. So if they are essential to each other, Einstein obviously thought so, then why the common notion of a division between these two in our age? I might add that if you told a Native American, I've had people say, well, religion and science, what the sacred and nature are incompatible. And I, I just tell them to tell that to a Native American, that nature is not sacred, or that nature and the sacred are incompatible. Mrs. Eddy pointed out that the Native Americans, the Indians, caught some glimpses of the underlying reality when they called a certain beautiful lake the smile of the Great Spirit. I should point out here, too, that I have five more minutes. Are you doing okay? Okay. I'm the opener for Fujiko, so I understand. That. <laughs> I should make the point that Mrs. Eddy says that a scientist cannot believe in miracles if by these are meant the setting aside of the laws of the universe on special occasions to impress people into a certain religious behavior. That was not why Jesus came. The teachings of Christian science, therefore, do not include miracles, but they certainly do include what have been called miraculous healings by people not understanding that. Mrs. Eddy writes of these, Nothing is more antagonistic to Christian science than a blind belief without understanding. For such a belief hides truth and builds on error. Miracles are impossible in science, and here science takes issue with popular religions. The scientific manifestation of power is from the divine nature and is not supernatural, since science is an explication of nature. The belief that the universe, including man, is governed in general by material laws, but that Occasionally, spirit sets aside these laws. This belief belittles omnipotent wisdom and gives to matter the precedence over spirit. She goes on to define miracles as that which is divinely natural but must be learned humanly, a phenomena of science. So can a unity of Christianity and science really be scientific? Mrs. Eddy thought so. She writes, Jesus of Nazareth was the most scientific man that ever trod the globe. He plunged beneath the material surface of things and found the spiritual cause. That's a good definition of what scientific practice is, plunging beneath the material surface of things and finding what's really going on. So to me, this could be a working definition of both Christianity and science, plunging beneath the material surface of things and finding the spiritual cause. Christian science healing is scientific and based upon the infinite principle of the universe, also known as love, spirit, life, soul, mind, and truth itself. Truth itself. You ever think of God as truth itself? That's kind of amazing. The study of Christian science unfolds the true spiritual nature of reality, the perfection of God, infinite mind, and of creation as the expression of this one infinite divine mind. I would say that Christian science is purely scientific, that is the most purely scientific discipline, because it admits only the evidence of intelligence and none of the evidence of the material senses. It reveals that reality is the ongoing creation of the perfect infinite mind's thinking. You're God's contemplation. Anybody ever said, let me reflect on that for a second? You're God's <laughs> reflection. You're God going, hmm, that's a good idea. So seeing God's eye view is what produces healing, not a fixing, but a revealing. Now, Fujiko will talk about the application of this science in such healings, following in the footsteps of Christ Jesus' method of healing, as rediscovered by Mary Baker Eddy 
in what in modern times is called Christian science. Thank you, Lawrence. Well, <laughs> well, just looking at this, and we are both wearing blue today. We just love this blue marble, don't we? How can we not love? And all those creatures and people in this earth, and that really transcends to me religion and science. That love transcends everything. So I was admiring the bouquet of flowers, and um, a bumblebee just flew right in front of me. And it's, we just stopped there and looking at the same flowers. <laughs> and I just looked at the bumblebee, and the question came to me, is this bumblebee seeing the same flower as I am? And we know from the science that because of the structure of the eye is different from the bumblebee's eye, eye structure differently from ours, that that flower appears differently. Do you agree? Yes. It's an infrared. I've seen it in the, the films and the pictures. Then the question came to me, what's the reality of the flowers? We just assume what we see is the reality. And can we say that then the reality is always in the beholder of the eye? No, so, sorry, the eye of the beholder. <laughs> You're supposed to correct me. <laughs> this is, English is my second language, my excuse. <laughs> okay, so it's the beauty or the reality is in the, uh, the eye of the beholder. What if we have an eye that is so beautiful and pure that whatever is seen by that eye reflects that beauty, reflects that love, reflects that purity. To me, that eye is the God's eye view. That is the eye that really is what Lawrence was talking about. And we know in the Bible, I'm going to be referring to these two books, the, the um, Holy Bible and Science and Health, the textbook of Christian science. And in the Bible, first of all, I want, um, um, I want to ask you, did you know the, the phrase, uh, you're the apple of my eye? Did you know it was in the Bible? Yeah. I didn't. I thought it was a pop music, you know, like a love song. <laughs> so I was really surprised when I found this. It says in Deuteronomy, he found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. And in Psalms it says, Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against him. Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Well, these are really beautiful um, verses. But then I really um, tend to ask a lot of questions, like little children. I said, well, were there apples in the Middle East at that time when the <laughs> Old Testament was written? You know, th this is why I didn't think it would be in the Bible. So I looked into the Hebrew text, the original text. And the original text reads, he kept me as the child of your eye. And what's the middle of the eye called? Pupil. <laughs> well, also, I found out I could not find the relationship between th that but, and the pupil as a child in your eye. But in ja Chinese and in Japanese, when we write eye pupil, it consists of two parts. It has character for eye, and right next to it, we write a little child. There's something about it that I, I think it's interesting because if I'm looking at a person who is six foot eight, a football player, 
When that person is reflected on my eye, how big is that person? Doesn't that teach us some lesson? How, no matter how big the problem seems to be, the enemy seems to be. Let it reflect it in the eye of God. It's a speck. There's nothing that we cannot handle if we really look through that eye. And so I really came to respect this woman, Mary Baker Eddy, who wrote this textbook, Science and Health, because she reminded me that we have the power to think, think from spiritual perspective. And that was all about what Jesus was talking about when he said to repent, to rethink. The, the text in Greek says metanoia, the word meaning think from different perspective. And that's what we're doing, checking to see what is the reality that we live in. Well, many years ago when I was in elementary school, I was washed over by this sense of love. And I just felt that it's so beautiful to love anyone, unconditionally, just to love. Not that I really had some boys that I really liked. I just wanted to love someone. And to a point that I asked myself, now, Fujiko, can you love that science teacher that everybody hates? <laughs> and the answer was overwhelming yes. Affirmative yes. And I even asked myself, can you marry him? And it was yes. <laughs> I didn't ask him. <laughs> but you know, this incident I never told anyone in my classroom because they probably thought I was weird. And when someone is not really liked by the class, whole, almost school, um, to say that I'm going to marry him would be really absurd. But a couple of sentences in this book reminded me of that incident. And it, the sentences are these. It says, Jesus beheld in science the perfect man who appeared to him where sinning mortal man appears to mortals. In this perfect man, the Savior saw God's own likeness. In this correct view of man, healed the sick. This correct view of man healed the sick. And it says, Jesus beheld in science. That's another word to see. What kind of man was he um, seeing? Mary Baker Eddy wrote everything in this textbook based on the study that she had done in the Holy Bible. In the very first chapter, we read the way man was conceived, was thought, reflected, as, as Lawrence said. It says in the first chapter of Genesis, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now in that image, do you see the image? That's something that you see. There's another one. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God. Created he him, male and female, created he them. And at the end of that chapter, it's written, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, how many times did I say see? At least four or five times, just in that sentence. And so Jesus beheld in science the perfect man is this man that is described in the first chapter of Genesis. And what does that seeing correctly have anything to do with healing? Well, from my experience, I'm not sure whether my science teacher was healed of anything, but I was healed of prejudice and hatred. From that moment, even if I was just still an elementary school student, I knew that it's not my place to hate or to like someone. But it was much, much bigger love beyond myself. So, and the fact that I could really love that science teacher, not out of pity, it was pure love, is because I felt that overwhelming love washing over me. It was love that changed my view. And then it really occurred to me that whenever Jesus saw the multitude, it is written and recorded that he had compassion. 
And I used to think it was just feeling sorry or just sympathetic. But the word compassion really means to embrace everyone in that bigger love, much bigger love that encompasses the whole universe, includes our own beautiful blue marble. That love, that's the correct view of man that brought the healings. Some years ago, I was invited to India in a place now, the city called Mumbai, used to be Bombay. Um, I was asked to speak to the nursing students or the medical students uh, in a medical institution um, to those who are graduating about uh, spiritual healing. How, say, prayer can affect a, a patient in either relieving pain or taking less medicine or recovering or never coming back for the same symptoms. And in the middle of my talk, the instructor raised her hand and said, I have something to share. And she started to talk and said to us, I used, I used to have uh, or was diagnosed with um, cancer in pancreas in the latter stage. And I just loved teaching. And I was so devastating, was depressed. When the whole family and relatives got together, uh, her niece noticed her being really down and not being her usual jovial self. So she asked, this niece asked her, what's wrong with you, auntie? So the aunt, this instructor, didn't want to say that she had a cancer. So she said, well, I have something really dark inside me, something very bad in the stomach. To this, this child looking up to her, straight in her eyes, said, no, auntie. You don't have anything dark or bad in your stomach. And gave her a really tight squeeze and ran off to play. Well, this instructor said, going home in the bus, her words were so pure and strong, and she could still remember her eyes. And she was going home in tears. A few days later, she had to go back to the hospital for further examination, really to decide what to do when they really didn't have many ways to treat this illness. The doctors, the group of physicians came together, and she was waiting to hear what they were going to say. They called her in, and they told her they couldn't find the cancer. <laughs> and that pure eyes, that could not, as, as Lawrence was saying, son cannot even have a notion of shadow itself. For this child, it has no darkness. Darkness was so unreal. As far as she was concerned, um, being, you know, knowing her aunt as a jovial, wonderful aunt, loving aunt. So that really alerted me to see that, OK, if Christian science is science, is universal. And all science has to be universal. I came from Tokyo this time, a couple days ago. And aerodynamics worked all the way here. <laughs> it didn't stop right in the middle of like, well, the Pacific. It was a turbulence, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Science has to be universal. Science has to be discovered. As my English teacher in middle school taught me, everyone, here's a book. Discover means to dis the cover, to see what has always been there. Science is revealing. And in fact, Mary Baker Eddy, the author of this textbook, uh, wrote in another booklet called No and Yes, that science is that which reveals God, reveals and interprets God and man. And for Christian, she gave this de definition Christian is the highest style of man. She didn't say Christians are the ones who were christened by this kind of church or following certain doctrines. She says is the highest style of man. Aren't we all looking to be more stylish? <laughs> and also, why wouldn't we want to know the science to reveal what it's, has already been there. 
we are always discovering. And this book is written for anyone who is seeking a truth. Truth, and that if you are seekers, you must be thinkers. And if you are thinkers, you must have this compassion. You must have this thought beyond your own self, that, that love overflows because we are already living in that love. So that I, Lawrence was talking about the time is not the factor in healing. Space is not the factor in healing either. One time my husband was climbing this, some wild countryside with my daughter in, in China. And I was in Tokyo doing my grocery shopping. <laughs> and I received a text from my, my daughter. It says, pray, Papa in pain. That's it. Just a few words. Nothing more. I don't know what happened. And I dropped my groceries, found the bench to sit down, and I closed my eyes, lifted up my thought, and thought, we are in the same space as God sees. That space is called love. And soon, I was trying to text something back to them, but I re received another um, text from my daughter, which said, Papa's fine. <laughs> I didn't find out till they came back to Tokyo that um, my, fa my husband was uh, exhibiting a symptom of food poison. He was bent, he's six foot three. He's bent, uh, how do you call it? bent? Over. Over, oh, thank you, over, and uh, in, in sweat, in pain, and could not move, shaking. And, my daughter said the next second, he, he just sat up and said, it's gone. And when I asked him, he said, it was as if someone, something really strong, like punched his stomach, and the pain just left. And there was no more of that symptom. And to witness this, I just felt that, OK, this is only possible if we are seeing the much bigger, what I said, love, but also the reality that spirit is governing the whole place, the whole earth, the whole universe. So it doesn't really take time to get somewhere because it's the same element that we're in. It was a sense of oneness that we all felt. So that was to prove that there was not a so-called um, hypnotism or placebo because the way it was done, I didn't even know what was wrong. But I was reaching out to the higher intelligence, divine mind, all is infinite mind, and its infinite manifestation. My husband was that one that had this manifestation. Um, when the symptoms disappear like this, whether it's cancer or pain, the symptoms of food poison, you just wonder, what did this author uh, say about this, this phenomenon? I found this to be very uh, helpful. She says, spirit and its formations are the only realities of being. Matter disappears under the microscope of spirit. I read this many, many times. And my husband is a microbiologist, so I know what microscopes do. When he sees microscopes, through the microscopes. He's looking for material evidences. What we do in Christian science is when we look through the spiritual, the microscope of spirit, matta disappears, because that's not what we're looking for. We're going to see what we're, going to, we're looking for, that what's the premise. If we are looking for certain symptoms in matta, then people are going to build a machine to measure that. But if we determine ourselves to say, I am spiritual, nothing can measure me. There's nothing in you that can be added to you or being taken away from the very moment that you're being conceived, like what I just read from the, uh, the Bible, the first um, the chapter in the Genesis. What did Christ Jesus say? He said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, 
Thy whole body shall be full of light. It's interesting because it says the eye, not two eyes. The light of the body is the eye. If, therefore, your eye be single. The word single in Japanese tr translation of the Bible says simple, pure, and single. What is that single? We have two eyes. We try to make sense out of our world with this mixture of good and evil or bad and good, the mistakes and perfection. And what do we get when we try to focus? Blurry. Jesus is saying, let's see it with one eye, which is one view, the God's eye view. Then our body shall be full of light. So when I was praying for my husband, who is in distance, but knowing, is, knowing that his body is full of light because God is seeing him, not because I was seeing him. There's another place in the Bible that says, and you're probably familiar with this, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Have you mixed two, uh, like bitter and sweet water? and experimented to drink it? Well, let's imagine when you did this. What happens? Hmm? What did you say? Is it bitter? If I put, yeah. Even if you put lots of sugar, if you're going to put bitter, it's going to be bitter. So this is saying something, seeing very found, fundamental. But I, when I looked up this word fountain, it was a word related to the word I that Jesus is using. So what is, why is a fountain the I? Are your eyes moist? Do you have fountain in your eye? Yes, you do. It's the same thing. If you are seeing that what produces, what comes to your thought is as like a fountain. We really want to make sure that has that one single eye view. When I just uh, became a full-time, which means I give up all other jobs to become a Christian science practitioner, I was summoned to go to um, Seoul, Korea. I was living in Pennsylvania, and they paid for my ticket to fly over all the way to Seoul, Korea, because uh, one of the members had an in-law who was suffering from the la last stage of cancer, and he was in the stage, state of coma. And right before he fell into coma, he got a permission to call me. So I flew there, and as soon as I arrived at the airport, they took me to the, to the hospital. And he had a very beautiful private room, um, I was taking in to sit right next to this man's bed, but nobody was there. The family members were outside. This Christian scientist left me there, and I'm thinking, this is a long, after a long flight, um, still wearing my winter boots, uh, in the, and um, just felt that, what am I doing here? I was just really thinking, am I really the one who should be here? And I felt the next second, what about this love? Love brought me here. It's not me. It's not about my own self being there. But love is here. And I just closed my eyes and thought of it. What does God see? What does God see? And I felt I needed to really think the synonyms of God, like life. He's active in God's view, I view. He is loved right now, and he is not only um, thinking, but is really wanting to do something greater. But the body is very still. I closed my eyes, and I'm not sure how long I was there being still, and suddenly I heard this voice, see what I see. And then, as soon as that voice came to my consciousness, 
this man made this sound. So I opened my eyes, and he looked at me, and he said something in Korean. So I knew that this gentleman spoke Japanese, so I introduced myself, and I said, I'm Japanese, but living in the States, was called to be here. So he said in Japanese, nice to meet you, Fujiko-san. And he said, where's my family? So I said, your family is out there waiting. He says, I want to uh, have you call my daughter. So I said, I will. And before I left the room, he said, I want to walk. So I went to get his daughter. His daughter was in awe, um, in tears. And as by the time we got back to his room, he was sitting at the edge of the, the bed, looking for his slippers. And he said he wanted to walk. His daughter on one side and me on, a, on another side. We walked the entire ward the whole, of the whole floor. And it was huge um, hospital. And you know, here and there, there are nurse, nursing stations. It's called nurse station. All the nurses are popping their heads out and <laughs> just being amazed. And so when I came back, you know, it was probably two in the morning by that time. She, he went back to sleep. And when I came out of the room, the gentleman who called me, the Christian scientist, said he had not walked for many months because he had a cancer in his leg. But it was so clear. He wanted to do something. When he woke up, it was not just, OK, I'm up. He already had the next activity in his mind to really prove that he was well. So next morning, I, when I went back to his room, he asked me, Fujiko-san, did you um, pray? I said, yes. And he just looked around and said, where? I don't see a statue. I said, I don't need a statue. I said, but then he said, but, but I'm Confucian. I said, that's doesn't matter. I said, my God is love, and it's also your love, your God. And he looked at me and said, is there a prayer that I can learn? He's saying all this in Japanese. And so I said, the Lord's Prayer would be a one thing to start with. And he asked his sons to get the huge uh, roll of paper to write Lord's Prayer in Korean, vertically, and put it on the wall of his room. This is a man who woke up, told me that he's Confucian, but he wanted to learn a prayer. And then we talked a lot of things. So one of the things um, that he asked me was, what is the purpose in my life now that I'm here? He said, I have built three uh, companies, and I gave them to my sons and son-in-law. What is my purpose now? I had no idea what to say at first. I just looked at him, but one thing that came to me was, Mr. Cho, your purpose is to love. And he just looked at me and said, OK. <laughs> and so the, when the next uh, you know, like nurses came and wanted to bring food or something, and he just looked at her and said, like, well, this job is really hard. I know it's really hard. You had to deal with me. Would you like to have a job in my company? Wow. And the nurse was like, was really surprised. And the next nurse came, and he noticed she was not wearing a wedding ring. And so, so she said, oh, would you like me to find you a husband? <laughs> this is the way he expressed love. And everybody was so surprised. And later that day, I found out from his children, up to the, the point that he became uh, in a state of coma, he was an angry, violent, uh, verbally violent, and unpleasant person to the nurses. No wonder nurses were surprised. <laughs> and on top of that, they told me, the children told me, he had never said thank you to his wife or his children, or never said delicious to any meals that his wife cooked. 
Can you imagine the transformation of characters? Because I don't know him as such tyrant, you know, and then to see him as a child who is so willing to say, okay, I love. The third day I asked him, what did you want to become when you were a child? Because I always look back to our childhood to see like who we were before we put on, you know, like a whole mask or the expectation that people had to become someone. He said, Fujiko-san, I always wanted to become a painter, an artist. But he said, my father died prematurely, and as a head of the whole clan, the oldest son, I had to take care of everyone. I took care of all the relatives, paid for the colleges. And I looked at him and said, it's not too late to be a painter. And you know, next day when I came to his room, he had a sketch pad. <laughs> He's a man of action. <laughs> and all the fruits and flowers that people had sent to his room. He's, he's you know, made, doing, doing sketch. And that, the hand, the paintings or the sketch that I saw is not the hand of someone who is, um, uh, how do you call it, amateur. It was the hand that had some training. Can you imagine? He didn't have to go through school to have those perfect lines. Because to me, all, the, all along his life, he was sketching and painting. It was not obvious outside. But this um, experience really taught me that Christian science is not really about just fixing body. It's not just one of the healing methods or healthcare but it's really about transformation of a character. For what? Why do we want the people to experience who they truly are? No, it's that love, the community, the people that are around, surrounding that person will also be transformed. You won't believe that children who have never felt so close felt very close, and every day they will sing songs to him. And, it was, and we became a really good friends till the end of his life. I was even invited a couple times back to, to see them. But at the end, he had told his children, I don't want any gifts from people when I go. I just want to give something back. To me, that is scientific, and that's Christian healing. Well, um, many times that we um, feel that this sense of the healing is um, a transformation, and when we are really aware of our environment, it really starts to change. So. If we are truly spiritual, we must be in spiritual environment. It's, it's like this air here. We don't really see with our eyes the, all the particles, but it's, we know it's there. It's like the fish in the water. I want you to close your eyes and imagine that you're a fish in the water, right? You're swimming without any efforts, only if someone is pull you out of that in environment, you suffer. But if you are in the right element, you will not suffer. And to me, it's if we know and be conscious that we are in spirit, and we are each one of us expressing that spirit as an idea, that we can really begin to see the endless, the actually infinite creativity and ideas helping us. And when I was sharing this one time, my colleague said, did you know that Sojourner Truth, the contemporary of Mary Baker Eddy, once said, God is like a 
a great um, ocean of love. We live and breathe, swim in it like the fishes of the ocean. And you know Sojourner Truth. She was a slave. Did she have any formal education? Where did she get that insight? It's something that we all can hear, just like Mr. Cho was able to see that not having the, the background of Christianity, he could hear this. And Mary Baker Eddy explains this, that it is the Christ that's speaking to each one of us. And in her words, it says, Christ is a true idea, voicing good, the divine message from God to man, speaking to the human consciousness. When Sojourner Truth had that insight, it was Christ telling her. She was a slave, but she left her name in the history. Mary Baker Eddy, when she was writing this book, had nothing. She moved from one house to another, was even abandoned by her own family, refused to have an inheritance because they asked her to stop writing this book. You know, otherwise, only one dollar she was going to receive. I don't think she even got one dollar. But how come this woman who had started from nothing writing this book, scientific book that we still use today for healing, and starting a church, a movement called Christian Science, we have the, I, I believe there's only one woman in the whole entire human history that established a church and it's still lasting. But she started from nothing. Is nothing a nothing? It's actually nothing is actually filled with that spiritual ideas. Because when we don't have anything material, now we're not distracted. We look for substance that is lasting. And I'm sure some of you have experienced this. Here in, in, in California, um, devastating fire had taken maybe your friends' home, communities, or even lives. When we have nothing, we feel that we look for the substance that is more permanent. And that permanence, that creativity and love people expresses, is something that we are not only engaged but empowered to bring about the practical steps for the next stage that we need for people who are in need. And I'm in awe. A um, couple of times I have visited California this, this year. I'm in awe of it, um, the resilience and love that you have in this state. Because nobody came to me and said, pointing fingers to others that uh, they were angry at someone. They were actually loving those who may have felt that it was, um, the fire was caused by themselves. Like in Reading, that I met um, the people who felt that um, they were, um, caused this fire and apologized to the entire community. And that one of the first person to send a message back to the, the couple was the one who lost his wife and two grandchildren. And everyone came together. And I know that that's that love and resilience is something that's really the substance that we are looking for and we move forward with whenever something hard happens. So when living in the environment of that oneness, that really feeling that we are in one environment of spirit, that we have access to the infinite. That's a, not the limited sense. And with the spiritual sense, we can find solutions to all the big problems or the small problems. Just like in the, at the beginning I said, no matter how big or the giant may be standing in front of us, in our eyes, it's going to be reflected as a little speck. 
And we know that that's the way God sees and gives us power, the ideas to be able to move on and to love not only this beautiful marble, you know, beautiful um, blue marbles, but more so one another that we really need to extend our love. So enjoy listening and moving and living in that spirit, the great ocean of love. Thank you. <laughs>